Professor Pat Utomi said, The fact that democracy in Nigeria is deteriorating has made citizens give up and accept elections as coup d'etat that civilians carry out. Nigeria's political class is pushing towards the failure of Nigerian society because there is collapse of culture in Nigeria. Please, guys, watch the video. It's not really about who you supported, and that's why democracy matters. It's about the will of the people. If a democratic process is appropriately followed and produce some candidates other than one you prefer, you recognize that a choice has been made by the people. It is their choice. And citizens rally to get things moving. But when the process has not been followed properly, uh, there is a cloud. There is a legitimacy problem for a regime and for a, any nation, especially a new nation, uh, legitimacy and how it's managed is fundamental. And one of the most important discussions around this subject uh, was in a book titled The First New Nation by an American called Simon Martin Lipset. And, and so legitimacy is so fundamental to how democracies make progress. And when there is a when there's a crisis of legitimacy, you can tell how much progress can be made. And, and this is why it is important to ask the question, was there a democratic process in place? And uh, obviously you've asked, and to some extent you've answered that question from your perspective, but do you see a dramatic Hollywood or even Nollywood ending to this presidential election dispute, possibly in favor of the opposition? Uh, whatever ending there is, the key is that that process help nation building in Nigeria. Right now, where we are is extremely worrisome for a vision of Nigeria that most decent people hold. And let me tell you my reading from studying countries, democracies, these kinds of challenges through the years. My reading is that we've proceeded into a very sad patch in which the constitution is easily giving short shrift. And that's the point that uh, Dati Baba Ahmed tries to make about what he says. And we can you know, throw more light on that if it comes up. When the people feel that a process doesn't reflect what they have agreed to in a modus vivendi, the ground norm, the constitution. Um, they restrain their giving of legitimacy to that process. Doesn't mean that process can't go on. Could it has lead to countries still going on? But the people do not believe that these coups have been carried out necessarily in their interest. And if you look at the conversation around whether democracy is dying, what can be done to save democracies from dying around the world. One of the more interesting ones was offered by a Cambridge uh, professor called uh, David Ronsiman. And, and that's part of the point is he tries to make that um, democracies die sometimes when in a kind of sophisticated manner, a civilian coup d'etat takes place. So if there is a significant number of Nigerians who believe that a significant civilian coup d'etat has taken place, uh, exists, it restrains democracy in a way that it leads to, in fact, some vicious circle. Let me tell you how I think these things will, will resolve themselves. If you take what happened in Lagos, for example, on the 18th of March, as a pattern, what you will see is that bullying as a way of getting your way in a governmental arrangement gradually becomes institutionalized. Anybody who does not agree is bullied in some form, and the outcome is full-blown fascism. Just check how uh, in Weimar, Germany, um, the Nazi party emerged. The role that Joseph Goebbels played supporting Hitler in propaganda terrorism, and look at what is happening in Nigeria, and you will see it clearly. I expect that in the Nigerian situation, 
as that process begins to play out. It will run into another major Nigerian problem, which if we had sat together as a people and reflected on, we could uh, confront more thoughtfully. And that is the problem of the fact that because we have ignored education in some parts of Nigeria for so long, we have a generation of people in their teens and 20s today who uh, have lived in ungoverned spaces for significant periods of time, have uh, been born with mothers who in their sixth birth at age 16 or 17 have passed on, so have not been raised with any human feeling, have been recruited by people who have all kinds of courses they are pursuing, and we have a clear road to Afghanistan in some parts of our country. When advancing fascism meets uh, this kind of trend in the country, boy, do we have a potential blowout for a country with the kind of promise Nigeria had in 1960. And that's the worry that thinking people have about what is going on. Uh, one public official who manipulates things to suit a personal need, whether it's a political, whether it's an ideological, or a money-induced uh, 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 reason, ultimately, the outcome crushes even that person. That's the trajectory Nigeria is traveling, that we may have full-blown fascism from this process, and this fascism will engage the road to Afghanistan. <laughs> At that time, the choices before us will be pretty limited. One, if you can, you leave the country. Two, if you can't, you'll be consumed by it. Or if we can all think clearly, sit together now, to recognize that our country is all dressed up with nowhere to go and begin to work at some solutions. Well, that, that's a very interesting an analysis that you've actually given there. Some on the opposite side of the fence would suggest that it's nowhere near as dramatic as, as sort of the Weimar, you know, Germany or, or Afghanistan or anything like that. Whereas I, I suspect a significant percentage of Nigerians would also agree with you. But of course, uh, Professor Utomi, history is constantly a battleground, isn't it? I mean, so for some people, this is and will continue to be the great sort of patriotic war, I, I guess people like yourself. So at each junction, something will stir things up again, and a whole new complex of political battles begin again. But they would argue that Nigeria has remained perhaps barely on top, but in any case on top of it since 1999? Well, um, you could say that it is okay to continue to exist, and which is what Nigeria has done. But if you are a country that has the kind of potential that Nigeria does have, and you function at a level that makes you the poverty capital of the world, and you function at a level where the Vice President of the United States stores Africa and ignores Nigeria. A President of the United States spent eight years, President of the United States of African descent, spends eight years in office, ignores Nigeria, never visits it, goes several times to South Africa. You, you live in this kind of situation. Your dignity as a Nigerian is definitely a challenge. Your passport almost stands as an embarrassment when you want to cross borders. And you ask yourself, what is the point of saying we survive these things if in reality uh, you, you barely have any dignity left to yourself because you carry that passport? Now, these are some of the considerations that lead patriots to saying, can there be a different way? Can there be a better way? Unfortunately, the obsession with power for the state of state capture, for the state of what I have actually referred to as state hijack, you know, look, I've served on the boards of South African companies and uh, for a couple of years on the board of one that, you know, really covers the continent, uh, uh, Deloitte. And at board meetings, one of the things that come up, like at every meeting, is the problem and the challenge of state capture. And, you know, South Africa set up the Zondo Commission 
after the Guptas and all of that. And, and whenever the conversation gets to state capture and why people seek public office, I kind of like laugh and say, well, I'm glad you South Africans are pushing hard on this matter. But you know what? <laughs> if you come to Nigeria, you'll understand what state capture is. What you have. <laughs> In fact, I had to characterize it enough to, you know, uh, talk to state hijack in, in in this book that i i wrote four years ago you know about citizenship you know state capture creeping fascism and the criminal hijack of politics in nigeria now this vision of nigeria is is not one offered lightly i can say i can say without any fear of doubt that most nigerians who have engaged me in the 40 to 50 years that i've been active will say that guy is a patriot. Um, he, issues of ethnicity in the choices I make, anybody can look and see the history and know that it is not uh, uh, much that you can, there's not much that you can say uh, uh, in that regard relative to the track that I have pursued. I can say that I have significantly, even the, uh, the president-elect, his nickname for me is citizen. Citizen because I work for the state and seek no material compensation for work done, real work done. Because my whole commitment has been to how do you build a society better for your children? How do you leave out this uh, um, obligation of citizenship that you make your shoulders available for the next generation to stand on so that they can build a better society because they can see further? That's a and very good point, Prof. Very, very good point. And, and I have to say that people like yourself have observed and participated in Nigerian politics to a greater or lesser extent even before 1999. I mean, do you recognize in the sequence of political events, and, and perhaps this might make you repeat yourself a little, but I mean, your, your thoughts are always very illuminating. Do you recognize in the sequence of political events a diminishing of Nigeria's democratic spirit every time, for example, the inauguration comes around? Or are there aspects of Nigeria's democracy that reassure you that it has been, to some extent, working since 1999? You know, part of the reason that this moment is enormously tragic uh, is that um, up till about a month, no, 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 two weeks before the elections of the 25th of February, I thought to myself, my goodness, look how far we've come. If you looked at the youth of Nigeria who defied the traditional cleavages, ethnicity, religion, uh, uh, geography, and where holding out to a new order. And I, I, I was amazed. In fact, I, I put down the title of a book, which I moderated, you know, We Saved Nigeria. That I admit it, but we nearly saved Nigeria. Just seeing how young people were galvanizing around an idea, not around cults of personality uh, that were nourished by uh, um, ethnicity and the rest. In fact, when you think of this, one of the most intelligent commentaries on what has happened to Nigeria was offered by the vice president, uh, uh, Professor Shibajo, at his uh, Nips Kuru uh, uh, um, lecture. Because you see, fundamentally, uh, human beings are judgmental. To make life easy, human beings turn to stereotypes. So this man is from this place. He must be this kind of person. And that judgmental nature can be manipulated very easily by politicians if they are not the right quality politicians. Even in advanced democracies, I, I, I've been speaking to work being done at Harvard Center for Moral Cognition by a group of scholars who bring together neuroscience, um, psychology, philosophy, using game theory on all that. We look at how people make choices. Uh, there's a, a professor there who's called Joshua Green who has essentially uh, led this work, and it's written an interesting book titled Moral Tribes, um, Emotion, Reason, and the Gap Between Us and Them. 
if we had good political parties that raised politicians who recognize where the country is going, they would have thought in the manner that Professor Yemi Oshimbajo thought through in that lecture. Unfortunately, when you allow politicians who really do not see a bigger picture than their personal grab for power, you use those cleavages, divide people, and make progress truly difficult. Now, <clears throat> Nigeria had made some progress in the movement that threw up uh, um, the Labour Party, Peter Obi, and all of that. <clears throat> but all of a sudden, within three weeks, we went from this nearly saving Nigeria to the gates of Hotel Rwanda. And you got to say to yourself, what is it about power that makes people unable to see the damage that they do in this pursuit? And so, yes, there has been some progress in terms of what happened, but that progress partly was made possible by the fact that terrible things happened. So there was a generation desperate for a new order. There were people around who had had enough of what the current order has brought us. And so those people said, we want something new. But they were often, like, powerless. Oh, what can we do? They will manipulate it. We know elections in Nigeria are a joke. They don't really work. <clears throat> and then Mahmoud Yakubu suddenly says to them, no, we have this system, beavers. We will swear on everything we know this will work. And suddenly they became more confident. Oh, my goodness. Maybe we can make a difference. Their hopes rose. But as it turned out, it was the ultimate 419 of all. When that turned out the way it turned out, their spirits sunk. Many started thinking of how they would leave Nigeria. Others began to look for options. But right. that, that's the trouble of where we are today. How do we reconstruct in the face of this that kind of situation? Well, you, you made a, a, a very good point there, which is that, I mean, the, the fact, of course, is that we are where we are, even though a lot of people would agree with you that that is not where we ought to be, but we are where we are. And um, you made the point that the reduction of democratic hope is something more and more people seem to be increasingly aware of. Um, and, and that, to, to some extent, is a positive thing, given how low things are in, in this country. The question is, how can they, from here on, continue to properly reflect on things um, so that politics matters more and more to individuals in a personal way. Yeah, it's a very interesting part of the, the development from this year that could be termed positive, if you want to put it that way. Um, about 1998, 1999, a group of uh, American scholars, not far from where I'm speaking uh, uh, right now, uh, Michael and a group of them out of Michigan State and elsewhere started this Afro-barometer. Afro-barometer uh, essentially brought in African scholars and universities from across the continent to kind of measure uh, um, interest in democracy on the continent. And it has provided us longitudinal data. Uh, from 1999, <clears throat> we saw um, people's attitude towards democracy continuously declining because they thought politicians didn't care about democracy. Nigerian elections were continually a joke. I participated in, in them as a presidential candidate. I've engaged foreign observers. I, I, I spoke with President Carter after the 1999 elections. And like I said, he was tongue-tied. He didn't know what to say. And for many years, President Carter, of course, is aging now, just root of Nigeria, would not come to Nigeria because of his experience in Nigerian elections. The one I participated in, in in 2007 as a presidential candidate, I ran with General Buhari and Atiku Abubakar. <clears throat> and in the uh, 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 aftermath of that election, three of us held press conferences, joint press conferences. And I recall conversations with them, uh, Madeleine Albright, former US uh, Secretary of State, and former Canadian Prime Minister uh, Paul Martin. And they were stunned that we could call what we had in Nigeria a democracy. But you have to find ways of saying things that don't offend. So uh, I don't know what, I don't remember what they said about the election. But he, 
So the fact that the elections have been deteriorating had led many Nigerians to giving up on democracy, accepting elections as coup d'etats that civilians carry out. And if you read Ron Siman, <coughs> and even better still, if you read uh, uh, Levitsky and Ziblatt, who wrote books with a similar title, I think Ron Siman's book is uh, How Democracy Ends. Ron Siman uh, and um, Ziblatt and uh, uh, Levitsky and Ziblatt's book is uh, How Democracies Die or something like that. Um, you will see a pattern recognized about the trajectory that even in some more developed countries, democracy is traveling and the things that need to be done to save that democracy. Right. The movement that happened last year seemed like a major effort to save Nigeria's democracy. And that's why those people got interested in politics. And then what happened, happened. However, right. a takeaway from it is that the consciousness that has been raised by their becoming involved may impact how they react, especially given how this process is resolved. It may either play it, may play it that way, that they write the whole thing off, or that they say, okay, it's possible when you raise your voice that something can happen. Right, but given, given that, um, and, and the fact that this is in, in, in the courts, I mean, obviously that process has to be allowed to um, go through. Um, but do, do you see Nigeria's democracy? I mean, or, or let me put it this way. How do you see Nigeria's democracy progressing from this point? Is that contingent on the outcome of the courts? Because if, if it goes the way that you don't necessarily want it to go, I'm wondering whether you would remain optimistic, cautiously, cautiously optimistic, or not at all optimistic. Well, there are many factors at play. Uh, thought leadership is a very important thing in this kind of thing. Uh, I, I was recently watching um, uh, Professor Osita Ubu's uh, TED talk uh, from out of Enugu, I believe, when he talks about intellectual freedom fighters and, and worries about the African intellectual who, for a variety of reasons, just accepts uh, what is sent down from Washington and all of that. He wants to survive and, and, and stop. African needs intellectuals. Who can provide thought leadership on what will save Africa? Uh, if thought leaders really come out and provide appropriate leadership, we may have a rethinking and a reinvention of African democracy. And so that can be one outcome. Uh, and the outcome to be whipped from the courts. I mean, people have different views about whether the courts can be taken seriously or not taken seriously. Um, Africans need to begin to rebuild their institutions. If you look at all the conversations around how human progress takes place, a variety of things are thrown up, but two very critical contending perspectives. One, progress is a function of institutions. I, I've talked about this for so long. I've written one book about that, uh, 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 you know, on managing uncertainty. Um, another is values, culture. Culture shapes human progress. We carry on in Nigeria today as if values don't matter. If our political class is not a values-based political class, what we'll get is collapse of the society. Right. And, and again, don't take my, 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 my ideas. Read Jared Diamond's effort in the book Collapse, how human um, uh, 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 society has failed through human history. And, and you will see in careful study after careful study that the Nigerian political class is pushing towards failure of Nigerian society because there's a collapse of culture in Nigeria. The values that they bring to the table cannot sustain social progress. Two, our institutions are not getting strengthened. And every time we uh, abuse our institutions and they can't push back right. on wrong, uh, we push ourselves down the path of state failure. 